All right, Shalom. 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 Once again, Shalom. Shalom. We want to welcome everyone who uh, came out to our Bible study on tonight. And obviously, we are once again swiftly approaching uh, the greatest of our holidays, of our holy days. The world has holidays. We have holy days. Days that have been set apart by the Most High Yah. And of course, these um, special holy days, um, they all tell the story of our Hamasiah. And as we um, attempt to reconnect with our roots, one of the first things most of us always do is normally once we realize that we are the chosen of the Most High Yah and that um, we are bloodline descendants or we've been adopted into the family or grafted into the family. Right. Notice one of the first things we do is one, change our diet because we start realizing the Most High has called us to uh, a particular way of eating based on the scripture because our desire is to follow the Most High. And of course, another thing that normally happens soon is that we begin to keep all of his feast days, all of his holy set apart days because, or as um, instructed in scripture, because we realize, uh, number one, that we didn't know them, and number two, that they actually tell the story of our redemption through our Hamasiah. And it also reminds us on a yearly basis of the marvelous plan to save uh, his people, Yah's plan to save his people. And it is told over and over and over again through the beautiful feast that we have. Um, we're coming up on Passover. Uh, we just had our New Year, hallelujah. We made it to the month of Abib, and um, if you notice, it's the most beautiful time of the year. It's the springtime. We don't start our year off in the dead of winter at 12 midnight. Right. We started it in, in the spring um, when it's beautiful and the flowers are blooming and all that, and so we started our new year, and we're working toward, obviously, our Pesach. And I wanted to share something tonight. Um, I want to deal with one of the elements um, during the Passover feast, or one of the feasts, I should say, that's in the Passover feast, and we know it as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We know it as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so um, before we get started, I want to give you the verse that I want to pull up tonight, and that is I want to look primarily at 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 5 verse 8 because uh, around the world some people have been taught that all the feast days of the of the quote unquote Old Testament you hear them say well that's Old Testament you don't want to do that Old Testament stuff and I don't know where we started doing that whole old versus new um, you know I, we need to stop that because the Bible is one complete book from beginning to the end and we, believe it or not, are still walking out the pages of the Holy Manuscript. So um, I want to show you tonight that the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is also the Feast of Passover, both of those feasts were called by both of those, I mean, those feasts were called by both names. Sometimes it was called the Feast of Passover, and sometimes it was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, so I just want you to know that and know that it is throughout what people say is the New Testament. As a matter of fact, this feast goes from really the beginning, and we talked about that at our last Bible study. It really starts at the beginning of the book and runs all the way through the Revelation. Um, but tonight I just want to focus on one area uh, mainly, um, and that is because we talked about the lamb slain last week, right? Mm -hmm. So this week I want to talk about this unleavened bread. And I want um, my Ishe to come forward, um, Hulda. Uh, not too often we get on the video together. I mean, she does her own videos most of the time, and she deals with the women, and um, she has a book out called Umpled by His Presence. And, of course, that's available all over the world, um, and people have been blessed by that book and workbook, and she has her own um, website, and she has some other things going. Plus, she does um, encouraging videos for our Hebrew sisters um, worldwide. 
And so she has her thing, and I kind of do my Bible studies and my sermons, but we don't often do things on the same night on the, together. So I asked her if she would share her study that she um, presented to us um, from the Hebrew language, dealing with this idea of, of leaven and the word leaven from a Hebrew perspective. So I'm going to ask her if she would come now and kind of introduce this to us tonight, and then I'll come back and, and talk a little more about what Rabbi Shai was trying to teach us. All right, here is my beautiful <laughs> Hula. Toda Adoni, Toda. Okay, um, on the Shabbat, um, I do the, like the Hebrew vocabulary words. And so because Pesach is coming up, um, we did the vocabulary word for leaven. And um, it was actually really brief, and I think it might be again um, with the addition of just the verse. And so um, what we looked at was the Hebrew word, and then we looked at the root, the two-letter root word, and then we put the two-letter root word and the word in context to the Exodus and gave a reason, not that we needed one, for why Yah wanted us as Israelites to remove leaven from our homes and from our diet during the time of Passover or Pesach. So um, let me give you the word for first. The word first in Hebrew is seor. And so that's spelled sin, aleph, vav, resh. Okay? And so um, we know that some of the Hebrew words have a three-letter root and a two-letter root. And so this word has a two-letter root. So it is originally translated as leaven. Um, and the term seems really ambiguous when we hear it from other people and they say, well, get the leaven out of your house. And everybody has a list, but nobody is actually using the scriptures to define exactly what Yah is talking about in the physical and in the spiritual context. So the two-letter root of the word, and I'm actually using um, an ancient Hebrew lexicon. There's other sources that I've used, but this one is something that everybody can pick up and find. Um, the two-letter root is shin resh, and it literally means to tie or to cord. So the pictograph for the sin or the shin is a picture of teeth representing pressure. And the resh is the picture of a head representing the top or the beginning. When you combine, combine these two, it gives the definition of a pressing beginning. So we know that ropes and cords were made from bark or from animal tendons or other things, and they were tied together and the fibers were tied together. So the first thing we see is that when Yah is taking Israel out of Egypt, there is the idea of a pressing beginning. It is literally the birth of a nation. So anybody that knows anything about birth knows that a child is pressed through the birthing canal. Right. So it's a pressing beginning. The same is true with the definition of leaven. So the pressing beginning happens out of affliction, and then it's to a new place. So in the sense of pressing beginning, we get that. In the definition where it gives a chord, Israel had been bound not only by the oppression of being in Israel, but by the customs. And we see that through the wilderness journey that Yah was pretty much tearing apart a cord or a, a relationship between Israel and Egypt. So the first thing that he tells them is, take the seor, which literally means pressing beginning or cord, take it apart, take it out. Mm -hmm. And so um, on the Shabbat, I, um, we, had, we did some historical research and leaven in the form of seor, which is what we call, um, it's a bread starter. And so how it was made was um, flour was taken and put in water. And we all know now that yeast is in everything. It's in our bodies. It's in the air and that we breathe. It's all around us. So it can't be getting just yeast out of your home because yeast is a live agent that is all around us. So we would have to remove ourselves from our homes if we were trying to get what they consider to be chametz, which is things that contain yeast out of the home during Passover. Okay, so what happens is you take the flour and you put it in water, and the, the flour and water mixture attracts the natural yeast in the air. 
And so over time, you add a little more and you add a little more and it starts to bubble and it becomes what they call a sourdough or a bread starter. And you would take this lump and then add it into the fresh bread or the fresh, fresh flour mixture and then it would take time and it would rise. Mm -hmm. So this process could take weeks. So when Yah says you're not going to have time, he's saying this is not going to be a, a week time. This is not going to, you're not going to have enough days. This is going to, my, my deliverance for you is going to happen right now. Right. So don't, you're not going to have time to make all these preparations. So he was giving a time frame because they knew how long it took for yeast to start. This was an Egyptian custom and it originated in Egypt. So when Yah tells them to leave the sea or, or the leaven in Egypt, he says, leave the custom of Egypt and leave the practices of Egypt in Egypt. So loose the bind or the cord and leave the things that you learned in Egypt where they are. Okay, so what is chametz then? Because that's what you'll hear during Passover. Get the chametz out of your house. It's things that contain yeast. It doesn't mean that every bread you eat during Passover will be flat because bread naturally, con well, flour naturally contains yeast. So it's not saying that you can't have a pancake that rises because it not rises naturally. So you kind of get what I mean. Okay, so hummus is literally this, whatever has the ore, which is this starter yeast, which actually um, makes bread rise. We have dry active yeast packets mainly, and it's in like sometimes tortillas. So even flat breads have yeast in it. See how that works out? So you can't just look at something rising or not rising mm -hmm. and then say, okay, that has yeast that doesn't because it's not necessarily always true. Okay, so, sior. Okay, chametz is a product that has yeast in it or has sior in it to be more, to have a better definition. And so, in Exodus 12, 15, it literally gives you what Yah is talking, what he's telling you to get out of your house. It says, and let me find it in my... The verses are not exactly the same in Hebrew. So it says, Shiv, Shivat, Yamim, Matzot, to, Tochal, Tochalu, Ach, Bayom, Harashom, uh, tash, Tashbitu, Seor, Mi, so it literally says, you shall, seven days, you shall eat matzot or matzah. Mm -hmm. And on the first day, you shall destroy seor or leaven from all your houses. So literally, that is what the commandment is. So now that you know what leaven is, you know the reason why. Now you can see exactly what Yah is telling us to do during this Passover season. It's way deeper than going around and removing the leaven because he also says to remove the leaven from our hearts. So, yeah, that's all I got. Uh, all right. Toda. You know, I always like to try to apply biblical concepts to the present. Mommy, mommy. Uh, today, yeah, what you say, Christmas, Easter, and stuff like that is the leaven. Yeah. We need to get rid of right. Those practices and those holidays are the leaven that we need to get rid of. You know, I, okay. I was going to say uh, that verse 1215, Marika, that verse 1215, uh -huh. you read half of it where it says to take the leaven out. Uh -huh. But then there's also like a consequence that he says uh, that whoever doesn't do that, that the soul shall be cut off from Israel. So there's like something behind it too. All right, so uh, I want to thank my Isha. Come on, y'all give her a hand now. She did a good job. Excellent. And um, this is the kind of information that we try to share with the family of um, the Hebrew Israelites worldwide. Um, um, I didn't really redo that um, camera so you might want to check it uh, but this is the information that needs to go out worldwide because uh, many people who are not studying the Bible from a Hebrew perspective will have you going through your house <laughs> trying to find every little thing in your house that has leaven and they don't understand 
like what she was trying to say that from the Hebrew perspective and from the Hebrew language itself, right, right. there is a particular, and what, what does she call it? Shemo? How do you spell it? Okay, or. Say or has to come out. And that is actual leaven. It is made from, well, she already did. I don't want to go through that all over again. But that's what he says to get out. Right. Now, why is that important? Because the root of that means and has to do with being tied to something that is not according to the Most High Yah. It is not according to the laws and statutes and commandments of our Most High Yah which is representative by, of course, Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, which we know as Egypt, which is the house of bondage. So what am I going to do is I'm going to loose you from the house of bondage, but also, if you, if you understand, i got to loose your mind also from their ways and their practices and their beliefs and things like that. Because the things that were done in African Egypt by the First Nation, the Hebrew Israelites that were in African Egypt, because remember they went in a family, came out a nation. Y'all remember that? Right. He was trying to get us not to learn their ways or not to keep their ways. Right. And so that's very important as we come to the study of leaven, because leaven itself, as we as we um, just learned, is going to be spoken of throughout Scripture. Right. Amen. And when, and when they mentioned leaven in the, back in the day, they wasn't talking about no soda pop. Are y'all in here with me? Mm -hmm. Amen. They wasn't talking about throwing out your deodorant and being musty for a week. <laughs> I'm just trying to help Israel. Right. That's right now. What they were really saying was that agent and that practice that you learn, yeah. I don't want you to do that. When it comes time for my Passover, um, now, we know why they didn't have time, but eventually, remember, we've, we've taught this lesson several times, and that is, before something can become symbolic, it first has to be what it is. Before, before it can become abstract, it has to first be concrete. Right. Y'all with, with me on that? You don't start off in the spiritual or start off in the abstract and then try to find the real thing. No, you start off and go, when he said leaven, what was he talking about? And he was talking about the agent. And he said, and when you put that in your bread, it causes it to rise over weeks. And of course, at that time, you cannot separate it anymore. Am I right about that? Because the leaven has successfully mixed in with the rest of the, well, the lump. All right, now I want to go all the way from Exodus. I want to flip all the way to what folk call the New Testament. And people are always trying to say what Paul told us we ain't got to do. As a matter of fact, it is a crying shame. I'm going to do a whole study on this. Um, I'm working on it now. I'm just, I haven't gotten it ready yet. I'm going to do a complete study on the teachings of Rabbi Shaul so I can once and for all put to rest this ungodly notion that Rabbi Shaul came here so that he could free us from all the laws of the Most High Yah. Right. And that is, one, it is unconscionable that a person would do that. And number two, if he did do that, he would be in line for a brick shower. <laughs> because one of the commandments was you cannot add to or take away from the word. In other words, Yah's word is final. So Rabbi Shaul has to stay consistent with the rest of scripture. He would never tell you not to keep Passover. As a matter of fact, he would never come and say, well, you know, Passover, unleavened bread, um, first fruits, and all that stuff. That's Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now. Y'all will get you some jingle bells and put them on your slate. And y'all get some uh, reindeer and, and, and some Easter eggs now because we, we free from God's laws and his festivals. We can now worship the devil's laws and the devil's festivals. See, he would never do that, Zion, because he was a Hebrew Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin from his own confession. Right. And in this 
passage that we're going to look at tonight, he's writing to, watch this, don't miss this, he's writing to Hebrew Israelites in one of the most corrupt cities known to human being and human history, Corinth. Corinth was a San Francisco, uh, New York, Amsterdam, all tied together. Atlanta, everything. Hey, what? Woo! What you did in Corinth stayed in Corinth. It was a terrible place when it comes to keeping the, the law, statutes of the Most High Yah. Do y'all understand that? And yet we have some Hebrew Israelites living in Corinth. Now every year in Corinth, they kept all of the pagan festivals. They kept the festival of Saturnella, of the, of the um, winter solstice, with, um, which is what y'all call nowadays Christmas. Uh, they kept all of those pagan feasts, um, that, and it's just too many to deal with tonight, but I just want you to know, that was their thing. So when the gospel went into, into Corinth, and it went primarily to the Hebrew Israelites who were in Corinth, and then those who had joined with them, because remember, that's the theme throughout the entire manuscript. You have the Hebrew Israelites as the children of the Most High, and then you have those who join with them. Right. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Everybody who joins with them, they're cool. Everybody who fights against them is all bad. Mm -hmm. All right? So when we get to Corinthians chapter 8, I mean chapter 5, there is something going on here that is so big as far as Rabbi Shaul is concerned, he takes out an entire chapter to deal with one issue that has arisen, has arisen in the congregation at Corinth, and he likens this situation to leaven. So I want you to see that. I want you to see how serious he is about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and about the Passover and the meaning of the leaven because he's using this chapter to really pick out a sin that's going on and when he, and when he in his mind, says, how can I relate this sin to something biblically, which is um, based on Torah, he likened this sin to leaven. Now let's, you Hebrews, I hope you can see this big screen up here. I think the camera should be should be all right. It says in verse one, and I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. It is reported commonly. Uh oh, that means it has become a scandal mm -hmm. that there is fornication among you. Now y'all do know fornication is any time a person has sexual, sexual relationship with another person outside of the biblical parameters, which is marriage. Right. Am I right about that? Right. And of course, we've been given laws, statutes, and commandments concerning what is lawful sexual behavior and unlawful sexual behavior. Am I right about that? In other words, true Hebrew Israelites don't have to ask certain questions like, is it okay for me to do this? Or is it okay for me to do that? Because we already have been given the manuscript and the 613 laws in the manuscript that tell us whether it is yea or nay. Right. Am I right about that? Right. So, so fornication is a nay. <laughs> and that means no, for those of y'all who don't speak the king's English. And so Rabbi Shaul is teaching, of course, that we are saved by grace through faith. But of course, just like in Roman, in, in, in Rome, as well as in Galatia, as well as in Corinth and other places, oftentimes people thought he was talking about lawlessness. Mm, yes. 
Rabbi Shaul was never preaching to be lawless. Right. He's saying you ought to recognize that it is by the grace of the Most High that you even get the opportunity to join up with him and live under his 613 laws, commandments, precepts, and principles, which, by the way, is the greatest law to live under on planet Earth. In America, we've got a whole lot of crazy laws. <laughs> Over a million, I think we got almost a million in California. And what makes a nation great is its laws. And since these are the most highest laws, that's why Israel was the greatest nation on planet Earth. So grace is not the absence of the laws of the most high Yah. Grace is the privilege of being under or in the house where these laws are established. Right. Hallelujah. Because I don't want to live in the house where there's no laws established. That's right. That's right. I don't want to be in a nation where there is no rule of law. I don't want to be in a place where everybody does whatever they get read. Now, now, in Corinth, somebody misunderstood the message of Rabbi Shaul and decided to go on and commit some fornication because they thought they was under the blood. Hallelujah. And there's not going to be no consequence for their behavior. And yet, Rabbi Shaul said... Uh, and such fornication is not so much named among the Gentiles. In other words, you Hebrews are committing a form of fornication, watch this, in the fellowship that the Gentiles that have joined you ain't even doing. Now, he doesn't mean that there hasn't been people in the world committing this particular crime. He's trying to say, in your community, you Hebrews are supposed to be being the example to the Corinthian believers of how to walk according to the faith. Because why? Y'all been in it. It's your heritage. It's, these are your ancestors. You have had the advantage of having the manuscript for thousands of years. He says, and here it is, that one should have his father's wife. Mm. Anybody in here see that? Uh -huh. yes. it's right there. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that these Hebrews that's hanging out in Corinth is preaching, oh, I'm saved and covered by the blood. Hallelujah. And then whatever you do, you just ask for forgiveness. It's all right. And so if I am sleeping with my daddy's wife, it's cool. Mm. Why? Because I'm covered by the blood. I don't think Rabbi Shaul took too kindly of somebody trying to trample the blood of Yehoshua underfoot. I don't think he took too kindly because he took a whole chapter to deal with this issue of being with his father's wife, of this man being with his father's wife. Now most people believe, based on the text, that this is probably his father's, uh, that this boy's stepmama. Or it could be that they, this man had more than one wife. Because you do know, uh, El Voice, that this ain't the first time a Hebrew did some creeping in order to sleep with his father's wife. Yes. You remember Reuben? Yes. I'm talking about our ancestors. This was the firstborn that was the strength of his, of his father's loins. He said, you the strength of my loin, but you weak as water. And you think I don't know what you did, Hebrew, when you crept up into my concubine's tent and slept with her. And Reuben was like, oh, my goodness gracious, I didn't know you'd do that. He said, man, I've been knowing ever since you did it. <laughs> in other words, in other words, we see that this has been a sin even before we got the Ten Commandments. Right, right. That's what I'm trying to show you. Right. We, we see that, that one of the tribe that was supposed to get the birthright lost his birthright mm -hmm. and committed this kind of wickedness mm -hmm. amongst the children of Israel even before we became a nation. Right. That's right. So this is what Rabbi Shaul was saying. He said, man, you, you having your father's wife? And then verse 2. Oh, by the way, uh, let's let's check and see whether or not this is a sin. Leviticus 
chapter 18, verse 8. Uh, Baikra, chapter 18, verse 8. Let's see whether or not our manuscript speaks to this sin. Or, or did Paul just make up some? No, he didn't make it up. Uh oh, verse 18 is right here, verse 8. Matter of fact, I'll verse start at verse 7. <clears throat> the nakedness of thy father, or the nakedness of thy mother, thou shalt not uncover. Did y'all see that? That's right. Why? Because she's your mother. What is wrong with you? Even your stepmother. And thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Now in verse 18, so that, that, that already tells us that we can't get down with no Semiramis and Tammuz, right? Because the whole mystery Babylonian religion is based upon this whore queen who married her own son. But we can't do that. We don't do that kind of foolishness among the Hebrew Israelites. It's wickedness to the Most High Yah. Verse 8. And the nakedness of thy father, of thy father's wife, thou shalt not uncover, for it is thy father's. It is thy father's nakedness. In other words, that wife belongs to her. So Rabbi Shaul says in verse 2, uh, you puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. In other words, instead of you all as a congregation coming together and saying, hey, this brother right here, he got to go because he's committing abomination in the sight of the Most High Yah. He's saying, no, y'all walking around bragging Talking about, look at the grace of God and how the grace of God is covering all sin. Even that sin is not a sin in the grace of God. You can't out-sin God. So this fella think he uh, out -sin the grace of God. So this fella decide he gonna try it. When Rabbi Shaul got the message, he said, for verily as absent in the body but present in spirit have, he said, for I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I was present concerning him that has done this deed. Wait a minute. He said, wait a minute. I ain't there with you, but I can make a judgment call even though I'm not there. Verse 7 says, really, I'm going to do it in the name of the Most High and in the name of our Master, Yehoshua HaMashiach. He says, uh, I don't need to be there. To judge this. Why doesn't he need to be there, Aki? Yeah, she there. Right. <laughs> but yeah, because the because Torah has already spoken. Yeah. Do you understand that judgment does not have to take place in a judgment hall? Right. That all you have to do is turn to the manuscript and see where the Most High has spoken to a matter. And whatever he says, you go with that. If he says he was wrong, then he's wrong. If the Most High say he's right, then he's right. If the Most High say he got to pay something, he got to pay it. If the Most High say he got to suffer a brick shower, brick shower's coming. Now that's the way it was in the land. Now there was always also provided for the sinner an opportunity to, well I shouldn't say always, I would say the majority of the time, there was provided opportunity for a sinner time to repent from his sin. And the reason why I said not all the time because I was reminded of a couple of fellas like Onan. Yeah. Um, I was reminded of some fellas um, that, that, that died immediately. Judgment came swiftly like Nadab and Abihu. So I won't say all the time, but the majority of the time if a person is repentant, that the Most High will forgive their sins and then cleanse them from their unrighteousness. Right. But in this situation, this fellow was not repentant because he said, he was saying in his heart, I'm no longer under the law, I'm under grace. <laughs> so how are you going to judge me? I can do whatever I want. Ain't no more sin under grace. 
Now watch what he says. He says, in the name of Yehoshua HaMashiach, when y'all get back together again in my spirit and with the power of our master Yehoshua, deliver such a one to Hashatan. Wait, what? He said, yeah, turn him over to Hashatan. You mean to the devil? Uh-huh. Why? It's right in the Bible. For the destruction of the flesh. What do you mean? Uh, turn him over so that he'll die out there with the devil. Now, he might not die, but turn him over to the devil so that the devil could have his way. This is equivalent, Zion, to being kicked out the camp. This is equivalent from, and you read the second part of that verse mm -hmm. that that um, Maisha got up here and read, um, where it says uh, at the end of that they will be cut off, mm -hmm. what from among the people. Right. And of course, for the most part, you know, me and you talk about that a lot, um, L boys. To be cut off from amongst your people in a howling wilderness. Yeah. Surrounded by enemies and wild wild animals, if you was cut off from the camp, it was most likely you weren't coming back. Because the enemies and the wild beast and the elements would all be against you. Right. Y'all got that. And so he's using the same type of wording here when he says for the destruction of the flesh. Now, verse 5, and I'm going to go faster now, that the spirit may be what? So what we're saying is that the life, that word spirit there is, is a, it's not a bad translation, but a better translation should say life. In other words, let his body, hopefully, if you put him out and he go through enough, he may end up dying out there, but hopefully he will his, he will have turned around in his heart. In other words, it's, remember Yeshua said, it's better to go into the kingdom of young without an eye, without an arm, without a leg. <laughs> oh, woo! Y'all with me, huh? Rather than, uh, rather than to go to hell whole. Right. And I, I wish I had time to do with that, but I don't. But I want to show you something. That he might be saved in the day. Watch this. Of who? Yahushua. Of Yahushua homosexual. Now watch this. All of us talking about we looking for the day of the return of our Savior. Oh, what a glorious and beautiful day. Oh, what a good and bright day. And we just say, I can't wait for that day. It's going to be a wonderful day. It's going to be a beautiful day. It's going to be a great day of rejoicing. Well, let's see whether or not the normal idea and the common idea of a day, of the day of Yah, matches the biblical definition of the, and description of the day of Yah. Y'all got time for this? Sure. All right, let's do it real quick. Let's look at, uh, let's go to Amos. Chapter 5, verse 18. Let's go to Amos. Because we need understanding in these last days. <laughs> Wait a minute. Amos chapter... Uh, 5 verse 18 and it's right there on the board right in the middle what does it say Whoa. woe <laughs> unto you that do what desire, desire the day of Yahuwah of <laughs> what he said whoa in other words you must not understand what that day is all about he said to what end is it for you 
The day of Yahuwah is what? Darkness. Darkness and not what? Light. He said, man, when he come back, y'all think it's going to be all happy and cheerful? Oh, no, no, no. It's going to be dark on that day. Why? It's judgment day. Verse 19. As if a man did flee from a lion. That means when he comes in, uh oh, like a lion jump out on you and you run from the lion and you, Mark, you step it. You it. Amen. If you step in, if you, if, if you outrun the lion, you're doing some running. And what happened? A bear met And a bear met him. That's the way it's going to be. You got to keep on running. In the last day. Or went into the house. In other words, you made it home. You running. You made it home. And then what? Lean your hand on the wall. That means you tired because you done ran from a lion. You got away from the bear. You leaned on the wall. And a serpent got you. In other words, what he's trying to tell you is, uh, shall not the day of Yah be darkness and not light, even very dark, no brightness in it? So the point he's making is the day of judgment is going to get everybody. In the book of the Revelation, it says there's going to be some folk trying to run to the mountain. They're going to be begging to, to do what? Follow me and do what? Hide me from the face, the very presence of the Lamb. This is what Rabbi Shaul said. We're not telling him, we're not kicking him out so that he can uh, uh, be ready for the day of the devil. That's not the day that's the ultimate judgment day. That's not who we're afraid of. The ultimate is the day of your shoe. Right. And what he's basically saying to this brother is, you don't want your whole shul to come back and catch you committing fornication, which is a breaking of his law, statutes, and commandments. He's basically saying this. He ain't saying, listen, if you, you know, uh, I almost said getting up on the downstroke and the most high come back. You can't be talking about I'm just going to plead this blood and tell him I accepted him when I was four years old at the Mount Zion Baptist Church. That ain't going to get it. So I'm hoping that this Hebrew, once you put him out, will spend some time, even if it means the destruction of his body, in order to get his spirit or his life saved from the Hamasiah. Yeshua. He's saying... Boy, you better get it right before our king get back. Because Hebrew is going to be all bad. Let me go back to my other text. Corinthians chapter 5. Watch what he says here. Uh oh, where does that come from? I'm online, y'all. I'm trying to get it. Uh, how do I get that version of the Bible? I was going to do, but I, I know I need to put this online, so I want to put the verses up. Y'all bear with me and uh, see if I can make this catch up. It was doing this to me earlier. All right, there we go. I want to use this version, the King James, because a lot of people, when you use a translation, some folks think that the King James version is the only version of the Bible. But in its name, it's a version. That's right. Yeah. The Bible was written in Hebrew. Right. And we're just reading it in English. Yes, right. so, so we don't hold the version to be holy. But that's a whole other lesson. I want you to see something. He says, y'all not, you got to understand that you shouldn't be boasting on, look at the grace of God. <laughs> what you should be doing is delivering this brother over so that his spirit, which is really his life, will be saved when the Hamasiah get back. Mm -hmm. And he said, your glory is not good. In other words, y'all talking about, oh, glory to God. Oh, praise his name. Oh, we, he said, hey, 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 hey. Y'all cut that out. And y'all going out here bragging about how the grace of the Most High is going to cover him in the last day. Uh-uh. I'm trying to tell you, 
Ain't no covering for that willful sinning and breaking of the commandments of the Most High Yah. There ain't no covering for that. When he comes back, everybody in that situation, and that goes out to all the house of Israel, who considers themselves, quote unquote, walking in the faith. Let me get to this next verse. He says, Know ye not, uh oh, what? That a little what? Leaven. Does what? Leavens the, the whole lump. Entire lump. Mm -hmm. In other words, you, you Hebrews in Corinth, I know where you live. I know that your little fellowship is right on the strip. I know they're gambling, shooting dice and carrying on around the corner. I know they're getting loaded, they're getting high. It's strip clubs everywhere. I know you live in Corinth. But I want, I'm trying to tell you something. The Most High told us that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. And if you let this in, then the whole lump is going to be affected. So he tells us in verse 7, purge out, therefore, the what? Now, do you think that Rabbi Shaul just came up with that? Or do we have a verse that speaks to that in, in uh, Exodus? Mm -hmm. So let's look at Exodus again. Exodus chapter 12, uh, verse 3 through 6. <clears throat> I'm just going to leave this verse up. Let's just flip it in your Bible. Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 through 6. Speak unto the house of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month you should take unto every man according to the lamb, according to the house uh, of their fathers and the lamb for a house. And if the household, okay, that's dealing with the lamb. I'm trying to get to the point where it talks about the bread. Marika just read it. I mean, Hulda just read it. What was the verse, Miguel? Exodus 12. 12 and 15. Oh, I didn't go far enough. Mm -hmm. Oh, 12 15. There it is. Right, right. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day shall you put away leaven out of your house. Isn't that exactly what he was saying in this verse, you Hebrews? Mm -hmm. That's right. He said, you got to put the leaven out, brethren. See, we got to start with the real leaven to understand what it is. And then he's now saying, now this brother is leaven. And that leaven is going to leaven the whole lump. So you got to purge out the leaven. Now he's talking about individuals. That you yourself will be a new lump. Wait a minute. Hold on. You mean to tell me I got leaven in me? Wait a minute, not just living in my nation, not just living in my community, not just living in my fellowship, but you mean to tell me that I got leaven inside of me? See, that's the whole purpose of us keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's so that we will take out some time and do self-examination for what, seven days. And throughout those seven days, we are to look for any leaven that's in our lives, Zion. Any leaven that's in our heart, in our mind, in our soul. And we are to purge out the leaven. What is the point of getting the leaven out your house if you're not going to get the leaven out your soul? <laughs> And that's what the rabbi, that's what Rabbi Shaul was saying. He's like, brethren, everybody getting ready for the feast. And you wrote me a letter about this brother, but y'all wasn't even going to deal with the brother, but you were still going to have Passover. Hmm. And not only that, you weren't going to deal with your own sin of omission and commission of the 613 law. He says, and I'm trying to write you and tell you what's the point of keeping Passover and keeping the unleavened feast 
by getting all the leaven from the corners and crevices of your house if you're not going to get it out your heart. Mm. Are you still with me? Oh, yeah, with you. <laughs> he said, you got to get that old leaven out so you can be a new lump as ye are unleavened. In other words, I like it when Marika had brought up Hulda. She said that the word means you've been untied. So if you've been caught up and wrapped up in a lifestyle that's not pleasing to the Most High Yah, a lifestyle of bondage to sin, then as we walk according to the Most High, now we have been released or untied from that. It says, well, don't let it get back in you. Why? Even, watch this now, for even Hamasia, our Passover is what? Sacrifice for us. In other words, you can make the sacrifice of getting that leaven out your house because you weren't called to be the lamb that was slain. Did y'all catch that? He said, I'm asking you just to get the leaven out. But your Hamasiah not only had no leaven, but he actually died for you. The least you could do is get the leaven out for him. Do y'all see that as plain as day? Let's look at this. Let's look at something else. Oh, by the way, there's some other verses I want to give you all about that day of Yah. Malachi 3.19. Joel chapter 2. Start at verse 1. And Zephaniah chapter 1. Start at verse 14. And you're going to see that that day of the Most High is a fearful and dreadful day. You definitely don't want to be Caught unaware in that day. But I want to show you something. Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 11. And again, I'm doing this on the fly. Normally I would have this already put out, but I just I just want to kind of show you something. Matthew. It's got to be a fast way to do this too. But anyway. Uh, Matthew 11. And we'll just, we'll just go there. And it came to pass when Yehoshua had made an end of his commanding to his 12 disciples, he parted thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now, when John had heard the works of Yehoshua, uh, he sent two of his disciples. Wait a minute, did I get John? Matthew? It's Matthew 16. 11. Oh, 16. 16, 11. 11 yeah. Okay, there we go. Probably worked that one in too. Well, <laughs> oh, that was a good one too. There we go. Matthew 16. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Let's start here. It says, uh, the Pharisees is, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting him, desiring that he should show them some sign. And he answered and said unto them, When it's evening, you say, uh, It'll be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, It'll be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. You hypocrites! Uh-oh, starting to deal with that leaven, aren't we? Mm -hmm. You hypocrites! You can discern the face of the sky, but, you can, but, but can you not discern the sign of the time? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Woo! -woo. Now he's going to tell them, you all are going to be instrumental in this sign because you do know it will be them that actually move Rome to the, crucif to the crucifixion of our Hamasiah. And he left them and departed. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Uh-oh. Regular bread, right? Mm -hmm. Then Yahushua said unto them, Take heed and beware of the what? Leaven. Of who? Of Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh oh, now they got leaven. Mm -hmm. Now we're starting to get a better understanding of what leaven is spiritually. Right. Pharisees and Sadducees are full of leaven. They're puffed up. Right. They're arrogant. They got head knowledge. 
that hasn't made it to the heart. They draw nigh unto to the master with their mouth, but their heart is very much far from him. And he told his disciples, don't get caught up in that Pharisee, Sadducee stuff. Don't do it. And they reason among themselves saying, is it because we've taken no bread? <laughs> you see how we always do it when Yah says something to us, we can never catch the meaning just like right now during Passover. Mm -hmm. Folks is sending out emails and letters and videos trying to tell people to get rid of their toothpaste and their deodorant and they, you know, and the socks and the something is sitting on the windowsill, throw that out and whatever. And thinking that the Most High is concerned more about physical bread and the leaven that's in that bread mm -hmm. than he is about the leaven in your heart. They said it's because we didn't take no bread and we <laughs> When Yeshua perceived, he said to them, oh, you little faith. In other words, woo, y'all. I mean, I love y'all, but you really don't have a good understanding of anything, do you? Mm -hmm. See, little faith don't mean ignorant. Mm -hmm. Faith has a lot to do with what you know. Right, it does. He says, I don't understand why you're talking about bread don't you know that when it comes to bread, I, you forgot all about the five loaves and the 5,000 people I fed and how many baskets you took up after? In other words, you think I'm talking about you not bringing some bread? Haven't I proven to you that I can take five loaves of, uh, and feed 5,000? Haven't I showed you that I took seven loaves and fed 4,000? How is it that you don't understand that I'm not talking to you about bread? I'm telling you to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then they understood how that he bade them, watch this, not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the what? Talk to me. Doctrine. The Pharisees and Sadducees were known for do what I say. But Yeshua said, but not what they do. He said, when you watch their lives, you're going to find out something. Sometimes they say the right thing, but they're always doing the wrong thing. In other words, the same group is going to, matter of fact, ain't no need to be talking about it. Why don't we just do this? Turn with me to John chapter, I think it's 18. John chapter 18. And then I'm, I'm through with the lesson. You guys have been so kind uh, to allow me this time with you tonight. I really do appreciate it. John chapter 18. Let's go all the way down. No, no. Yeah. What's this? Verse 28. Let's take a look at some of this leaven that's in these Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they led Yeshua from Caiaphas, who was the high priest at that time, a Pharisee unto the hall of judgment and it was early and they themselves went not into the judgment hall wait a minute they carry in the homosia who was innocent by the way because they want him dead they want him killed before the Passover mm -hmm. but it says but they didn't go into the judgment hall lest they should be defiled do y'all understand? Did you hear that verse? Mm -hmm. You have led the you went and arrested the Hamasia in a garden. Mm -hmm. And then you took him to Caiaphas' house. And now you're taking him to the judgment hall, but you so holy on the outside. You got murder in your heart. Right. You got envy in your heart, malice in your heart strife in your heart and yet 
You don't want to step foot in the judgment hall lest you be defiled, but that they might do what? Eat the Passover. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you kidding me? Oh, but that's, that's what's going on amongst our people to this very day. Murder, envy, hatred, strife. And you're talking about, um, but you know, I gotta find all the little pieces of bread crumbs in the house. No, I'm not telling you not to get the bread out. Don't get, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if you're gonna get the leaven out your house, you got to get the leaven out of you. Rise. Now let's go back. Let's go back to uh, First to First Corinthians, and then I'm through. Y'all been so kind. First Corinthians. Chapter 5. And let's look at this last couple verses. He said, Purge out the old leaven. He said, For even y'all, because our Hamasiach, for even our Hamasiach, our Passover is sacrificed. Therefore, what does he say? Let us do what? Keep the feast. Wait, wait, huh? Let us do what? The now, is this Old or New Testament? It's new. Now, we got all these Hebrews all over the world going to these churches and in these, some people even going to these temples. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to tell you, Paul said we ain't got to keep the past. Paul said we got free for Paul said we ain't got Paul said and they go on. Paul, 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 Paul. Every time you tell them something, Paul and then you say, brethren, the, the, the most high said, I know what the, that's the Old Testament, but Paul said, but I have not heard not one of them pull up 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 and say, Paul said, therefore let us keep the feast. Right. It's right there. As a matter of fact, if you really read this in its original language, you will see that it will actually say, therefore let us keep Passover. Because that's really the feast he's talking about. Let us keep the Passover, the feast of unleavened bread. Watch this. Not with old leaven. Why? He's already told us why. Old leaven leavens the whole lump. Neither with the leaven of, there it is, malice and wickedness. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity. And what's the next one? Truth. Truth. Two things. Get rid of the leaven, yes. But make sure that, number one, when it talks about sincerity, it, when, when you're really sincere, it has to do with a commitment to or dedication to. And, of course, here it's Torah, mm -hmm. the teachings of Yah. And, of course, truth. The truth of the Bible is also Torah, the teachings of the Most High, Yah. So he says, if we're going to do it, let's not just keep a feast on the outside. Now, we got some Hebrews out here talking about, and some heathens out here talking about, you don't have to keep the feast at all. That Paul said it's done away with. No, he said, no, keep the feast. But don't do it superficially. You want to keep it on the inside and out. You want to keep the Most High Laws, Most High Yah's commandments, statutes, principles. You, you know what day to keep it. You know you're supposed to have the leaven purged from your home. But you now also know that that leaven is not just speaking about the bread. It's talking about the spiritual ties to idolatry right. and lasciviousness and malice and envy and strife and fornication and all that. He says, untie yourself from that. So that you can now keep the feast with a sincere heart and in, and, and in truth. Um, he says, and uh, he said, I wrote uh, unto you in an epistle not to even keep company with fornicators in verse uh, 9. He said, yet not all together with fornicators of this world. So he even shows that. He says, two people, you don't want to be hanging out with folk who this is their lifestyle. He said, but even more important is not hanging out with people who have 
a spiritual fornication with the system. The world. How do you commit fornication with the world? It's the Babylonian thing that, that, that um, John talks about. And on, when, when he wrote the Revelation, he said that it, these people have fallen into the bed of fornication with the whore of Babylon. He said, get out from under them. He said, because if you don't get out, when the Most High comes back, that's why we have to keep these feasts yearly. And we have to talk about this stuff to remind ourselves that that great and awful day of judgment is coming to planet Earth. And you don't want to be in the bed with the whore. Right. Talking about, oh, my pastor said it's all right because we saved by grace. Mm -hmm. Oh, he said it's all right, did he? Mm. Well, on that day, he gonna be running mm -hmm. from a lion and meet the bear. He's gonna make it to the house, and lean up against the wall, and a serpent gonna get him. Mm -hmm. Because you're not gonna escape leading our people astray. Right. What we should be teaching our people is come out of Babylon. And walk according to the ways, statutes, commandments of the Most High Yah, so that when He comes back, He will separate the sheep from the goat, and we'll be with Him. Right. But you think you're going for eleven? You can forget it. That's not how it works. He said, "Get rid of the eleven. He said, "But let's keep the feast." So that's the end of my lesson tonight. I hope it goes out worldwide. I want to thank again uh, uh, my Ish. Is it Ishe or Ish? Ishe, Isha, for blessing us with that introduction. That was good. And I know that uh, it went out and was well received. And I pray that this message was also well received because what the Most High wants from us is what? He wants us to be pure. Sincere, inside, and out. So as you Hebrews get the leaven out your house, in a couple days we're going to be doing that, you know. Uh, the most important thing to do is to get it out your heart. Shalom, shalom. Shalom.